is in boundaries and the command of the security officer or the police officer or the 17th century enclosure hedge in rural England or the way the cafe owner frowns upon the smelly person who's spending too long over their coffee. Those are all the ways in which territory uh, works and exclusion works. Now most of us, of course, benefit from the right to exclude and its territorialized form ensuring access to secure and stable housing uh, resources, including housing. But more marginalized people, of course, tend to have a closer relationship to the experience of being excluded and the work of territory. They're, they're geographers in a much more intimate sense because they understand territory and its exclusionary logics because they have to, uh, because they're constantly uh, at risk in terms of that, uh, of that logic. And that gets worked out in all sorts of ways. I just finished reading a book by Matthew Desmond uh, on eviction, uh, which is a wonderful book if you have the chance to see it, uh, about the work of eviction um, in the rental market in uh, Milwaukee in the US. Um, and it's a sort of ethnography of the experience of territorialized exclusion, if you like, in my own terms. How can we think about this relationship between exclusion, property, and and territory. Obviously, it's a complicated question. One way, perhaps, is in relation to this concept of precarity, which has become quite fashionable in recent uh, conversations. Precarity, a condition of enhanced vulnerability and, and uncertainty, a generalized uncertainty. Precarity understood both as a set of objective conditions, like deregulated working conditions or uh, the removal of protections in terms of rental housing, those sorts of things, as well as the experience of such situations. For precarity is a very interesting concept, particularly when one thinks about it actually in relation to property and to property law. Precarity can, one definition of precarity is as, as, is as a situation that is, quote, liable to be changed or lost at the pleasure or will of another. It's a vulnerable relationship, a power relationship, in other words, between somebody who has, uh, who is control, in control of a situation and someone who is in less control of a situation. In civil law, one talks about a precarium. And a precarium in civil law is a contract which allows someone to use something as long as the owner allows. So in common law, you talk about a tenancy at will. I don't know what the Turkish or the civil law equivalent would be in uh, the Turkish context. But precarium is made on request. It's made from, from, sorry, it's made on request and it can be revoked at any time. A request, another way of thinking about a request is as a, a prayer or a precarious. Precarious literally means to beg or to entreat. It is a prayer where you're praying for some you know, intervention in your life. So, in property, one talks about the grantee's hold on the land, somebody who owns the land in that relationship as holding the land uh, in terms that are precarious. Property relations in contemporary society as expressed in housing and labor markets, in that sense, can be said to be based on a prayer for many people, deeply precarious if one thinks about that relationship. So what we've done so far is talk about private property. <coughs> Let's shift the terrain a little bit because we're interested not so much in private property, but we're interested in common property. To understand common property, if we follow McPherson, we need to think about private property as well. But Pherson's point, or one of his many points, is that property is much more than private property. We've only thought about property as private property for the past two or three hundred years. Property is much more than that. It's much more commodious a concept. McPherson insists for the simultaneous recognition of a conception of common property 
which is predicated on the right to not be excluded. Common property, he said, is created by the guarantee to each individual that he or she will not be excluded from the use or benefit of a thing. Private property is created by the guarantee that an individual can exclude others from the use or benefit of something. And you'll note that he puts those two things together, and that's an important point. Let's unpack that notion of common property. Common property, he argues, is a right. A right, of course, must be justified. A right must have an end that it can be sustained by. But Furson is unusual. He's a political economist, like I said. He's also a liberal. And that combination of liberalism and political economy, I think, is, is unusual but also productive. On the one hand, he's attentive to property situation within capitalism, as we've discussed. But he's also a liberal, but he wants to open up liberalism and open up the concept of liberty that is at the center of liberalism to a much more uh, broader and progressive understanding. He claimed that his central goal was, this is his, the person himself, quote, to work out a revision of liberal democratic theory. A revision that clearly owed a great deal to Marx in the hope of making that theory more democratic while rescuing that part or that valuable part of the liberal tradition which is submerged when liberalism is identified as synonymous with capitalist market relations. So property rights, liberalism tells us, are valuable to the extent that they maximize human liberty, individual liberty. But the ends that liberty sustains can be defined in a number of ways, a person argues. The dominant way of understanding the ends of liberty associated with private property are the view of Locke and Hobbes and of the last two or three hundred years. Humans are first and foremost the appropriators of material utility. Property is valuable to the extent that it maximizes individual satisfaction or individual utility. A second conception, however, a much older conception, one that's fallen from view, McPherson argues, is based on a view of humans not as consumers, but as doers, as creators, exercising uniquely human powers. The ability of human beings to exercise their own powers, McPherson argues, is a marker of essential human dignity. And this is a very ancient concept. You know, we can trace it back to Aristotelian kind of virtue ethics, notions of human flourishing, uh, purposeful activity that leads to human flourishing, where human flourishing uh, leads to multiple ends. It's not one singular conception of uh, that is sustained by uh, flourishing. Uh, it's plural and uh, leads to sort of incommensurable goods. Human capacities to be fully human must be under one's control rather than the control of somebody else. The right to exclude, therefore, must be supplemented by a right to not be excluded. Because the right to exclude diminishes those human capacities uh, under capitalism. Consequently, we must open up property so as to include not just the right to exclude, but the right to not be excluded. Because without that, those human capacities cannot be fully uh, realized. Now, this is a, an argument that rests on a whole bunch of interesting claims that I think speak to common right more generally. <coughs> Most immediately, the right to not be excluded matters most particularly to the precarious, to those who are marginalized, those who are forced out, those who suffer the full weight of the right to exclude. And that's an important point. It's tempting if we simply, for example, think about uh, the commons, which I'm going to criticize, uh, as this group of people who come together to share a set of value resources and so on. We like that idea, certainly, but it would also include things like condos or gated communities. Those are commons too, surely. Do we like those in the same way that we like commons that we value? 
Well, if we align ourselves with a view of the commons as this singular, um, uh, singular conception, um, uh, I think we are, we are on difficult ground. However, if we remember that the right to not be excluded matters in particular to those who are more marginalized, uh, then I think we can begin to differ differentiate between different types of kind of common-based uh, property. The right to not be excluded matters intensely in a place like the downtown east side of Vancouver. A marginalized neighborhood right in the center of the city, struggling to survive in the face of a powerfully intensified property machine. And, uh, things calmed down a few years ago as the uh, real estate market collapsed, uh, but now they've come back uh, intensely. So gentrification-induced displacement is very much on the agenda. The territorialized right to exclude is clearly in evidence. You have a large population of people living under conditions of precarity, literally, living under, on, living in precarious tenancies in legal terms, uh, subject to the will of others. Uh, we find increasingly landlords who own uh, some of the large private residential hotels that house many more marginalized people, uh, using creative uses of property law to evict, to expel, to increase rents, to convert properties to more uh, higher end uh, uses. You know the story, it's, it's I'm sure a, a common one. So rents are increasing, uh, hotel conversions are occurring. So people are losing their homes. But exclusion is much more generalized than people simply losing their homes. In 2011, a group of local activists published a report called Zones of Exclusion. And the Zones of Exclusion report notes that gentrification not only leads to increasing land values and all those other sorts of things, but it also, quote, produces a kind of internal displacement for low-income residents by creating zones of exclusion. And those zones include spaces that poor people are excluded from because they lack the economic means. They can't afford to go into those places or go into those shops. Or ex spaces from which they are expelled because of intensified surveillance and policing and so on. But exclusion is at work in an increasing, in a much more generalized sense, the report also notes. As land is used to build housing for the rich, as the report puts it, it no longer becomes available to a low-income community. In this sense, the report said, gentrification excludes possibilities. Ultimately, the report says, quote, as gentrification produces more and more zones of exclusion, low-income residents become alienated from their own community. This is the experience of internal displacement, the feeling of being out of place in one's own neighborhood. But exclusion doesn't just constrain. It takes something away, something of value, a valuable entitlement, a valuable set of relationships, a sense of what is at stake in the something that's being taken away is evident in the attempt to carve out a social justice zone in the core of the downtown east side. I think it's useful to put the social justice zone alongside the zones of exclusion. The social justice zone is said to protect principles and resources that are of value. It's said to be a space where low-income people and their basic human and social needs, quote, have priority over profit, unquote. It's imagined as, quote, a place where low-income people Low-income and vulnerable people have a right to be and won't be pushed out. In other words, there's a claim here, if you like, for the right to not be excluded. An appeal to social justice. The freedom to exist, the freedom to endure, the freedom to survive, the freedom to simply be as humans. We can see then, with the zones of exclusion and the social justice zone, the struggle against exclusion and for the right to not be excluded. For McPherson, as I think perhaps also for the people of the downtown east side, the right to exclude has to be countered by the right 
to not be excluded as a common right, a common property right. Non-exclusionary rights are valuable because they provide the resources that are necessary for people to advance their uniquely human capacities. They're flourishing as human beings. <coughs> but we can push this a bit further. But first, and talks about this thing called the right to not be excluded, which is a sort of weird kind of language when you start thinking about it. It's a sort of negative and positive set of assertions that are at work there. And I think that's actually useful because it combines exclusion and inclusion. The right to not be excluded. Exclusion is problematic because it negates access to some valued asset. So exclusion is bad, not just because it excludes, but, but it takes something away, something that is important. The right to not be excluded is a positive right for something, as well as a negative right to not be excluded. It's that combination that I think is kind of one of the productive dimensions. But it also gets us to the dual dimensions of common property in relation to exclusion and inclusion. We need to think about both of those things together. You can't just think about common or commons on their own, they need to be thought of in relation to private property, and private property also needs to be thought of, I think, in relation to common property. And you can see that articulated in various ways. We see it with the zones of exclusion, social justice, so, but also in images like this. This is a picture I took uh, probably 20 years ago um, in the downtown east side. This is a, a building site very large, very crucial building site uh, that was about to be converted to private condos, uh, a space, oh, as you might imagine, over which there was intense activism on the part of uh, local residents. One of the things they did was to paint on the windows um, images of flowers and slogans and so on, the local residents. So the, uh, the owners of the building put up these plywood sheets to uh, pre prevent people from drawing, and people, of course, started drawing on the the building, the, the plywood itself. So on the top, you know, we have the, the right to exclude, right? The private security that's being, you know, the threat that protecting this site. But the graffito, I think, are useful. And not only does it say, give it back, right? As opposed to, you know, something else. But this one here says, these premises are protected by the community of the downtown east side. So, you know, it's a dialogue between those, the right to exclude and the right to not be excluded. Another value of McPherson's analysis is that he takes us towards or encourages us to think about a more active, verb-oriented sense of commony. I think that's useful. Property is about relations. Relations between people, inclusionary, inclusionary or exclusionary, in regards to a set of valued resources. Those relations aren't static. <coughs> They're enacted, embodied, performed. Recognizing the relational dimensions of property, whether it's private property or common property, is useful. It's useful in several senses. One, because it complicates this idea of the commons. Nouning the verb taking something performative and active and turning it into something fixed and static. The commons, where the commons can easily be thought of as, a, as an object, as a, as a thing, or as a space. Right? And uh, certainly in the commons literature I've seen, the, the references, the endless references to the English rural commons, right, as this sort of you know, imagined space of freedom, um, uh, I'm rather tired of. In part because, actually, if you look at the commons in English, the English rural setting, it wasn't just about spaces, it was also, of course, about relations and access and use that were not simply about a space. But thinking about the commons gives us a kind of propositional language. It wants us to nail down what this thing is, what is the essence of the commons. And in so doing, we don't think about it in relation to a set of human enactments and human relationships necessarily. I mean, we don't say the private, 
right, when talking about private property, but we do say the commons when talking about common property. That seems curious. Another dimension that I think is problematic in, in, in thinking about the commons is that it's hard to think about the, the, the relational and performed practices associated with common property in real places like the downtown east side, which is all about commoning in all sorts of ways. Commoning has a performative dimension. It's practiced through overt acts of protest and uh, poetry and occupations and squats, but it's also practiced simply by being there. Everyday acts of presence, of occupation, of reiterated use, of ingrained habitation, simply by being in a space for a very long time and using that space intensely, as you saw many of the residents in that film. In so doing, we see the performance of the right to not be excluded. One aspect to this, or one example of this, is a tent city that was established in a place called Oppenheimer Park, in the very center of the downtown east side, in the summer of 2014, so two years ago. It was a protest over access to housing. In other words, it was a protest over property arrangements and its territorialized dimension. People cannot access a res res uh, resource which they need. It included many homeless people, those who, of course, lack any access to private property. The generalized protest becomes materialized in an occupation. In so doing, we see a common, an assertion of the right to not be excluded in physical presence, physical occupation in a material uh, space. Now, the tent city, you can see in the middle, there's a teepee here. And that's important because the tent city included many indigenous people who face intensified forms of exclusion based not only on, on poverty, but also, of course, a colonial legacy of dispossession uh, and violence. And many residents uh, of the downtown east side are indigenous peoples from actually all over North America. Now, that becomes interesting because the city issued an expulsion order they said, it's our land, it's our park, you have to leave. You've been here long enough, the protest is, you know, run its course. This is the response from the tent city. First Nations or the indigenous people respond with their own eviction order. They evict the city, symbolically, from Oppenheimer Park. We, the indigenous people, here today in Oppenheimer Park, <coughs> we hereby assert our Aboriginal title which actually is a legally consequential term in, in the Canadian context. Our people have held title to this land since time immemorial. We were here before you guys. We are exerting our right to exclusive authority, recognized as an inherent element of our title over this land and this camp. We now require that you leave this place and cease any attempts to remove people or their belongings from this uh, place. Um, so here's commenting in a different register. It's not about physical occupation. It's now a, a symbolic language that invokes invokes uh, legal legal concepts, invokes uh, claims to property, to territory, to citizenship, and uh, and so on. An invocation, actually, of property rights. Aboriginal title is a property uh, right. So it's a claim to not be excluded, but it's also a claim to exclude. We exclude you in order that we cannot be uh, so easily excluded. There's a positive right here as well as a negative right that's being asserted. It's a complicated bundle of ideas, but it's also a form of commoning, I want to suggest, in the way that McPherson perhaps might help us think about. What happened? Well, you might guess what happened. The city wins. They get the court to give them an injunction, and the uh, tent city is clear between competing rights might decides. Yet, we see continuing struggles uh, that continue to endure over indigeneity and land. But it's important also to unpack a little more the complexity of this place, because that's important in understanding the complexity of common property and common right. Oppenheimer Park, this little park right in the center of um, the downtown east side. I know Istanbul is, has an interest in little parks that have symbolic attachments uh, and so on as well. Oppenheimer Park is is a park that is layered with 
historical practices of commoning and the right to not be excluded. Oppenheimer Park was named after a former city mayor who was, guess what, a land speculator. He made money from land, and he made money from land when the city was carved out in the late 19th century. It was carved out, uh, of course, on indigenous land. The city itself continues to be carved out on indigenous land based on the legal conception of terra nullius, that the land is empty, that no one is here. Now, for indigenous people, for whom this is traditional territory, Musqueam and Squamish and Sailvertooth First Nations, this park is part of their traditional territory. It's a space that included many valuable resources. The territorial grid that created the park, sustained by state violence, displaced them, of course, from their traditional territory and makes it into <coughs> Vancouver. Although, as you saw in the their eviction order, they continue to argue that they have title and sovereignty, wish to assert the right to not be excluded. But there are other layers. The, this image here shows a, uh, a Japanese-Canadian baseball team. Because the park is adjacent to a uh, large uh, community or was, or did contain a large community of Japanese Canadian residents, working class residents. Um, they were forcibly removed in the 1940s and interned, held in camps in, uh, in the center of the, uh, the province, and their property was liquidated. All their land and assets were sold by the state. Park continues to hold a, an annual festival, a Japanese Canadian festival, <coughs> sort of symbolic recognition of memory and politics, um, to acknowledge that presence. And interestingly, the festival organizers in 2014, because they were going to hold this, the festival in Oppenheimer Park, but there's a tent city now in Oppenheimer Park, the festival organizers, in an act of solidarity, elected to move the festival elsewhere and lobbied the city not to remove the tent city on their name, you know, in terms of their own interests. The park is also a site closely affiliated with labor organizing, particularly in the earlier years of the century. There was a famous gathering in 1912 involving a group called the International Workers of the World, the Wobblies, as they were known more colloquially. The Wobblies were the union that tried to organize the most precarious uh, of workers. The people are the workers on the margins. They were forced to use the park because they couldn't access the work site. The territorialized right to exclude prevented them from accessing the work site and lobbying uh, or engaging with workers. So they go to the park and the city then tries to, uh, well, successfully uh, expels them from that site. So we have a space, in other words, that's dense with history, dense with politics, but also dense with the logic of exclusion and the right to not be excluded, playing out in complicated uh, ways. Which gets us to another complicated question. Multiple claimants, multiple histories, multiple, uh, multiple, pe multiple people who've experienced or continue to experience marginalization. How does one begin to acknowledge those multiple claims? That's an ethical question, a complicated ethical question. We don't do it, I think, by invoking the commons. If by the commons we think of something narrow and spatialized about a group, a community, a fixed unitary membership, insiders and outsiders. A zero-sum logic, right? Because that says one group is more important than the other. It's about this community as opposed to that community. And that's simply <laughs> ethically unsustained. However, a view of common property as a right to not be excluded, I think, is more compatible with a view of multiple claimants and multiple uh, interests multiple claimants sharing a space 
both as recipients, as beneficiaries, and as trustees of a space. Common property is not about groupness, but about relationality, an ethic of non-exclusive relationality, if we follow McPherson. Commons, commoning is not about some essential singularity, particularly one based on fixed notions of